Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that doesn't just lead to a job, but it leads to a career. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach. And I'm Anika Madden, and I am a parent. It is Thursday, January 10th, and welcome to episode number 50, The Difference Between Super Scoring and Score Choice. And this week's news, as students head to campus, colleges fear a decline in international enrollment. And we're in chapter 50 of 171 Answers, and we're explaining the practices of test super scoring and score choice. And to commemorate our 50th episode, we wanted to do something special for you all this week and uh, very worthwhile for you, our listening family. So stay tuned for a very special bonus segment. We're very excited. And Mark continues with Rick Clark in the final part of how to handle deferrals, denials, wait lists, and acceptances. Okay, listening family, I know you always hear Mark leading this segment off first, mostly, but I'm going to do it this time because I just asked Mark if he had ever watched the movie Bird Box. (laughs) (laughs) He said no. (laughs) I said no. I didn't say no. I said I never heard of it. Exactly. So, so Mark, (laughs) let's get to know the man, Mark. We know that you're a college (laughs) coach, Mark. What else do you do? What do you love? What do you tell? Just tell us, ramble off in 10 seconds or less your top three. What are your top three likes? Especially, I guess you're, what are you going to really dive into for 2019 since we're here now? So for casual entertainment, I love sports, especially football and basketball, especially my Michigan State Spartans, my Michigan State Spartans. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit of a political junkie and I love to read Mm -hmm. nonfiction nonfiction and travel and i like to go to different ethnic restaurants oh look at like you the, okay yes yeah definitely, what's, definitely. What's, what's, non-chains 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 what's one of the recent so, like, ones you've been to and i'm assuming you're talking about in the a right in the atl yeah well, well i'll tell you this like one time i took a trip to florida with the family and a nine day trip and all nine days it was a surprise. We went to a different ethnic restaurant. They didn't know like one day it would be like French and it'd be like German, Aww. you know, and it'd be like Mediterranean and they didn't know what we were doing, but that was really fun. Everybody talks about it, Aww. especially that French, French bread that got flown in every day from France and West Palm Beach. Nice. <laughs> now go yeah. home and watch Bird Box. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Tell them, family, go watch it, please. I, 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 I do watch some Lifetime movies no. sometimes when I'm working. <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. In the news this week, as students head to campus, colleges fear a decline in international enrollment. And this is found uh, pretty recently in the Huffington Post by Miss Sophie Quinton. And the New York Times, Mark, reported in early 2018 that colleges have been cutting professors, programs, even athletic teams in response to falling international enrollments. And um, there's a senior advisor at the Institute of International Education that says that there are three major factors that are driving this decline. And I'm going to quickly go through a mark and I'm going to let you dive right on in here. So the first one is that uh, specifically the Saudi and Brazilian governments have scaled back scholarship programs that that have allowed tens of thousands of citizens to go to college overseas. Wow. Did not know that. Secondly, other countries such as Australia, Canada, and Germany, they have stepped up their efforts to attract international students to make it easy to remain in their countries and work. Uh, Smart move. And finally, um, there are restrictions to international student visa programs by our president, Mr. Trump. Um, And he vowed who vows to reduce immigration overall that have made students very wary of coming to the United States for a higher education. And um, so the article goes on to outline how these um, how these various things impact certain campuses. And one example that they gave is the University of Illinois in Urbana. And they say that the they they state specifically that the expected decline in international students won't 
necessarily hurt the bottom line, but it might affect the number of scholarships that they can offer. Pretty critical, right? And then another school states that any loss of any group of students could hurt. I mean, if you got a big group of 2,000 students, whether they're from overseas or here, like that's going to hurt their bottom line. So Mark, you want to dr- drill down on this a uh, wee bit further? Okay, that was a real good summary, Anika. But I'll, let me hit on a couple other things. Uh, I think you went a little easy on the Trumpster there, <laughs> Mr. Trump. And you talk about because I, cause I think there's some okay trying to save my energy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the Donald, the Donald. Because there's a couple other things that um, really are attributed to him. So the Trump administration is definitely making it harder to get visas. You brought that point up, but they're also making it harder for spouses to work. Um, so that's a deterrent because a lot of times, hey, where's the money going to come from? A lot of times the plan is for the spouse to work when the student's on the student visa. They're making that harder to do that. They're also making it harder for graduates to stay even if they have skilled labor. Um, and then that's out there. Word is out there. So there's a perception that there's a hostile environment. Uh, and so those are some things. Now, an additional factor is guns on campuses. So places like Texas, unfortunately, Georgia, and some other states are now allowing kids to have guns on campus. And, you know, most countries don't have anywhere near the kind of guns that we have in this country. So the thought that, you know, you could have a gun on campus is produces fear and trepidation, you know, in in the eyes of most people around the world. Like, why would I want to go to school where somebody may be packing a gun sitting beside me? So those are are some of the factors. And how serious is this? Well, the State Department is saying that 393,000 less student visas have been issued from 2016 to 2017, a 17% decline. Mm. It is substantial. So here's my question for you, Anika. Why does this matter? And why is this important for our 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 listening audience, friends, family to, to know about this information. Cause money is money. Um, to the point that one of those folks made earlier is that a cohort of any students is missing is going to hurt. So if the tuition isn't coming in and if you're having to lay folks off and to, to cut back on programs, how is that not an issue? Right? No, that's definitely one of the factors. So I think the school you're talking about was central Missouri. It was featured in the article. Um, and they were down 2,000 students, 2,000 international students because mm-hmm. of all the reasons we mentioned. Right. And it was like $14 million in the budget, and it led to, to massive layoffs that had to happen. Um, you know, and, and, you know, another thing that people need to realize is that schools recruit internationally – partially for cultural diversity, right? It's pretty cool to meet someone from India or Sweden or Jamaica or wherever and get to know them and learn their perspective, Mm -hmm. get to know them in the dorms, see what they add to class discussion. That can enhance and strengthen your education as a component of diversity. But there's another major reason why schools recruit internationally, and that is because they're these almost always are full-pay students because most of the time there's not institutional need-based aid for international students. So these are full-pay students. A lot of schools have extra international fees. So for example, the article talks about the University of Illinois, for where one out of every seven students is international, and international students are imposed an extra $5,000 in fees. And so that money was directly going into scholarships for Illinois state residents. So I think it's important to underscore every now and then that schools are also businesses. They're nonprofits, but they're businesses. And so anything that has potential to adversely impact the revenue that's coming into the coffers, I think that's important for our audience to know that because that's going to mean one of two things, either uh, curtailing and a cutback and a reduction in services. So you drop departments or you let professors go or you have to increase class size or an increase in cost to supplant that money that you've lost. And, and so we want our audience to know anytime anything can impacts the business aspects of schools. And this is a widespread problem right now that has presidents, you know, provost boards very, very, very concerned if this trend continues. I know 
last year alone, um, the number of international applicants are down significantly. Yeah, I don't know. It's just something to be um, uh, alert to um, as a parent at a school, at any school where funding and stuff is getting cut and slashed. Um, I would want to know how I can help with that. I don't think there's much I can do um, besides contact my congressman and yell at him and try to vote for somebody in 2020. I don't know <laughs> what else we can do. Well, I, I, I mean, I think it's incumbent upon all of our families or anybody looking at college to be able to learn how to assess the financial health of the institution. Right. Now, just because you have a decrease in international students, that doesn't mean all of a sudden you're in precarious financial you know, footing. It doesn't mean that. But you do want to be studying certain trends at your school, such as are applications decreasing, is enrollment decreasing, okay? Uh, you can actually look up the school's financial records and you can find out things like what's called their net tuition revenue. And is that decreasing? And so these are all things that you want to be aware of and to get a sense of the pulse of the institution you're looking at. Of course, you can look at endowments, but endowments are more important for private schools than public schools. Mm -hmm. uh, for public schools, you want to know what is the state appropriations like? Are they, is the state giving 12000 per pupil, 8000 6000 4000 What's the trend line on that? These are things that... Uh, are important to kind of know if you're, particularly if you're concerned about the financial solvency of your school. Hmm. Did, was that boring? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like we just, I just feel like I just got deep into the weeds and I'm just like, I'm thinking that somebody might be like, snore job. <laughs> It is what it is, Mark. I mean, we can't. <laughs> That's your politically correct way of saying it was boring. <laughs> it's all right. I asked for honesty. I wanted it. Thank you. Let's let's move on to the next section. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time for our step-by-step -step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are in chapter 50 of a book I wrote called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, where I take on the most frequently asked questions that I get from students and parents. And we're winding down on, we only have a couple more weeks to look at various questions related to test scores, and then we will be done with that. But one that commonly comes up is, what is super scoring? And also, what does score choice mean? Are those the same or are they different? Mm -hmm. So what were your takeaways from this chapter, Anika? And then I'll, I'll uh, chime in with some thoughts. So I had to carefully outline because I totally confused myself when I was reading through this because I thought one was the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to explain. So and most people do, by the way. They're yeah. very con confused people. Okay, mm -hmm. so correct me where I'm wrong. Here's, here mm -hmm. I am submitting my test, okay? So super scoring mm -hmm. is when a student takes a test more than once, but the but you submit the scores uh, from your best areas from certain sections and combine them into one score that is considered by the school. So let's say Naya takes a test in August and then she takes it again in December. But her math uh -huh. score from August is the best, better than December. And her verbal uh -huh. score in, let's just say, August again is better than December. So she uh -huh. takes those two scores and puts them together. And then the school says, okay, hey, you got total this, you know, is, but it's from two different test settings. So what I didn't know, Mark, well, first of all, how was that? Like, do, do I totally understand uh, that? I'm, pretty, I'm not pretty, sure. Pretty close. Pretty close. The only thing that I would correct on that is you made it sound like Naya was doing. Like you said, she submits, she combines. It's not the individual that does it. It's the school. Ah, so, for example, okay. let's, let's use an SAT example. Mm -hmm. So you take the test. I'll, you take it in October. You get a 600 on your evidence-based <coughs> reading or writing. And you get a 500 on your math, right? And then you take it again, let's say in December, and this time it's reverse. You get a 500 on your evidence-based reading and writing. You get a 600 on the math. So with school, when, score, when school super score, your score is now a 1,200, 
where even that your cumulative score for each of those times taking the test was an 1100. 600 plus 500, 1100, 500 plus 600, 1100. But your actual score is a 600 because once you post a score in an individual subscore, you can never lose it. Even mm-hmm. if you go down in another administration, once you bank it, it sticks. And the only thing you can do is improve upon it. Does that does that help? A little bit. And I'm going okay, so to ask our listeners to send an email because um, they may be lost in the sauce like I am. Well, it's not necessarily being lost. It's just about taking the highest scores out of two different. I keep saying test set, administrations. Yeah, test administrations. Okay, I keep saying set. I say test, test administrations. Yes, test administrations. So I got a different I got a six, dates. I got a six hundred in math in August, but I got a five hundred mm-hmm. in math in December. So they're going to use my six hundred mm-hmm. math in August. Okay. So Correct. okay, so let's move on because I don't want to dwell on that too much because I I'm gonna start to overthink it. So one thing that you pointed out is that most colleges super score. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't know that was a common mm-hmm. practice. Yes. I was like, what the heck? Definitely. And and one thing to highlight, and we just got finished talking about international students, is that score requirements may be different for international students. So international students, please take heed. It might be a little different for you. Now we go. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, yeah. So it's not just that there are schools that don't super score. So you want to check a school's policy to see whether they super score or not. Mm -hmm. Some schools don't super score. Some schools do. Most do. And, you know, normally when I tell people this, they're like, that is so nice of them. It's so kind of them. It's so (laughs) benevolent and magnificent. And I have to say, yeah, but they want their numbers to be higher, too. And so the score (laughs) averages look better for them. Um, So it makes them look better in the store guides and all the places they report their numbers. But also, in fairness, the mindset the school can have is, look, you got the 600 one time, so you at least showed us you're capable of it. Um, And so we're going to, you know, give you the benefit of the doubt that you can do that because you showed us that you're capable of it. Okay. So um, now with the ACT, because the history of the ACT was different and the intent of the test was different, um, you'll find quite a few schools that won't super score for the ACT that do for the SAT. But the bottom line is you need to check the school's policy, which will be on their website almost always whether or not they super score for the SAT and the ACT. And um, uh, Prep Scholars is a website that's done a really good job at combining all the schools that super score for the SAT and the ACT, and they normally update it at least once, if not twice a year, because schools do change these policies. So if you don't feel like going to like 10 or 12 websites and taking 10 minutes, I've found that Prep Scholars list is pretty accurate. So you could also just... Uh, put it into Google, um, super schools that super score prep scholar, and it will pull up a list of all the schools that uh, super score for the SAT and those that do it for the ACT. Okay. So now let's dive into. So are you still lost in the sauce? I want to no. know if you're lost in the sauce. No, I'm a t- well, this is going to be a determining factor because now I'm about to go into the school okay. choice, which I thought okay. was super scoring. And mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you why. No. Tell everyone why. Okay. So mm-hmm. I did not realize that when you take a test, the school. Okay, let's just say Janet takes a test three times. They're going to see mm-hmm. all of those scores. And so, from what I understand, Mark, go ahead and jump in where you might. Are you asking you me or are you telling me that they're going to see all three of those scores? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ask- well, I'm not asking you yet because I want to finish my thoughts. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> but, okay, so from what I took of this, the score choice is that you decide what the school sees. Like you determine, Correct. okay, you're going to see this and you're going to see this. Now, I thought you did that anyway. Like I thought when I, take no. a, when I take a test three times, oh, I'm only giving you this and I'm only giving you this. And okay, there's your super scoring right there. There you go. 500 okay. in December, so- 600 in August. Okay, there you go. I didn't know that. Okay, so, so 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 score choice is nothing to do with super score, other than that the only thing that really they have in common is that we're still talking about the ACT and the SAT. Super score has to do with whether they combine scores from different administrations, combine subscores from different administrations to give you a higher cumulative score than you may get on any one test administration. That's super scoring. Score choice has to do with whether or not the school requires that you send 
every test administration to them or whether they give you the prerogative of deciding yourself whether you're going to send only your best scores versus have to send all of your scores. Mm. See the difference? I do. Now I do. So what happens is, see, yeah. So when you take the test, um, you don't have to send the scores initially to anybody, right? You can say, I'm not sending the scores to anybody. Like You get four free score reports from the ACT and the SAT. Each one gives you four freebies, you know, before they're going to charge you like twelve, twelve fifty a piece to send them to send them off per school. Um, so you can see them, and with score choice, you can say, you know what, I like this score, I'm going to send it off. But if a school does not practice score choice, then they you are integrity bound and honor bound to send every test administration you take, whether you like the scores or not. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. lost in the sauce or clear no i'm super clear and i don't like it because <laughs> <laughs> you're a control freak <laughs> maybe i'm just joking no, I am. i'm just joking i'm and just it's joking okay. no i'm just joking mark that's okay <laughs> <Go ahead>. <laughs> <laughs> because what i'm saying is i don't like it because it's not fair like I, I, you shouldn't have to Why clean my fair? dirty laundry. Like, let me just clean my laundry over here, and then I <laughs> send it to you when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so let me say a couple of things. First of all, most schools do allow you to practice score choice. So most schools allow it to be your choice to allow them to see what scores you want them to see. Probably because they feel the same way you do, and they know that people don't like it, and, <laughs> right? And so they don't want to. They don't want to add stress to people's life if someone takes a test and let's just say it's a, <laughs> you know, an ACT, and they get a twenty-one in a section, but then they, you know, maybe ACT has a lot of timing issues, as we've talked about. So someone figures out the timing issues, and now they get a twenty-eight, mm -hmm. and now the school never even knows about that twenty-one, the right. dirty laundry, as you called it. Right. So most schools do that, but. This is where you're going to think that I'm like <laughs> a little bit not gracious. I would seriously consider if I was an admission director, particularly at a highly selective school, I would seriously consider not allowing score choice. Hmm. Even now, the reason I would, the reason, the one reason why I would be t prone to do it is because I know people like it. So I know I'd be pissing off some people it, by saying, no, we're not practicing score choice. But why do you think I would say that, Anika? Like, I would seriously consider if it's my decision and it said, it's up to you, Stucker. What do you think? And we're going to do what you think. Uh, there's a really good chance that I would say, no, we're not going to practice score choice here. Why do you think I would say that? I don't know, but it's not right. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to hear my reason first, don't no, you? No, I don't. <laughs> No, <laughs> Mark, it isn't right. So, okay, you better. You got thirty seconds. Why? <laughs> it better be good, right? Yes. All right. So think, 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 think about the purpose of of standardized tests. The purpose of standardized tests. One of the purposes is supposed to be, and this is what my boss used to say all the time. Mark, it's the only common benchmark in the file. Now, we know, we've talked about all the advantages that educated parents have, the advantages mm -hmm. that affluent parents have, exactly. and the correlation between education. We know that. But it is true that that test is more similar, the actual test and the scoring for that test, than any other thing in the file, right? So people write recommendations completely differently. Grading systems are completely different. It could go on and on and on and on. Different extracurricular opportunities are afforded at different schools, even curriculum choices that are offered, all kinds of things. It's all very, very different. So the idea of the very concept of even having a standardized test, look at the name standardized, is that it should be some element of it where when I'm looking at this apple, an apple over here is an apple over here, not an apple and an orange. Mm. And the schools that say we're not going to allow score choice, what they're saying is we think it's something that should be considered if a, somebody took the test six times and somebody over here took it one, one time. We think it's something that should be considered if somebody's score pattern, let's say on the ACT was they took it four times and their science scores were, I'm just picking one area, science scores. Their science scores were 24, 22, 25, 30. Okay. We think that's something that we is a factor. If we're really trying to make sense of what this means to be weighed into our process. And it's, you know, schools like information because knowledge is power. 
And, and so I can understand why wanting to have that knowledge, either to compare the person that takes it six times versus one, or the person that has a very inconsistent score pattern, that's just worthwhile knowledge to kind of file away. Now, I don't want to make too much out of the test because the test, you know how we feel about the test. I already feel the thing is overrated. And I feel on the extremes, it tells you something. But the murky middle, it mostly doesn't tell you any much because it doesn't speak to your motivation, your drive, your organization, your resiliency, your relationship with teachers, and many other factors. But Nevertheless, it is a factor and it does reveal some information. So that's important information. And I can see why a school would want to know that information. Was my reason good enough? I know I didn't take 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know that much. (laughs) Listen, my answer is, did you hear my answer? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. (laughs) Do you see any any validity to a school thinking that? (sighs) Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and some schools, well, while this isn't always true, some schools use it to suss out whether someone is score obsessed or not. Like you're taking a test this many times, it shows a certain score obsession versus someone else that does it. Now, that's a little bit unfair because, you know, the person doing score choice might be just as obsessed. They just right. they only showed you the best one. Right. You know, I get that. But schools, you know, it. Knowledge is power and you're learning information. You're looking at the pattern of their score. You're looking at how often they're taking it. Probably the person that's taking it five, six times is putting such a priority on their test prep that that's also a factor because these schools really, they want you to get high scores, but they don't want you to be test obsessed either. Okay. Okay. I did. I didn't convince you. <laughs> if, we, if we were on the same committee, you'd be voting it down. I guess you're just more of a grace person than me. John, cut to the music. KK. <laughs> <laughs> the one reason why I might, I'm the one reason that gives me hesitation is because you are not alone and people do not like it when, are you trying to tell me I got to send my bad score? Now, of course, it's an integrity issue, right? Like a school right. doesn't know if you're not honest with them. All right. I now have integrity but, and I'm know, going to send it. <laughs> but I'm yep. That's saying. what I tell every one of my clients. Send it. What You know, because, you know, they try to get out of it. Do I really need to do it? I said, can you read what it says? All scores must be submitted. <laughs> so darn and full of integrity. <laughs> <laughs> Listening family, we are in episode number 50 now. I hope you all feel as excited as Mark and I feel because that's huge. Like this, we're we're fifty years old. Like that's crazy. We are fifty years old, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> we are celebrating our fiftieth birthday. So with that, uh, we're gonna take it down to twenty though, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna we've taken twenty. This is our special content, and this is so relevant, y'all. Listen, this is so relevant. This is so awesome. So we've taken twenty ways an applicant is evaluated in the admission process. And Mark is quickly going to state if and how these things, these 20 things are underrated, overrated, or properly rated by the average student and parent. Now, Mark, I think we need to make the point that these are by um, very selective schools, mostly highly selective schools. But Mark, you did want to make the point, maybe, am I saying this right, that there are some schools that take some of these things in consideration, maybe not all at some level? Did you want to expand on that? Yeah, so a couple of things I want to say. This is really important. There's going to be a lot of caveats here. First of all, most of these things are by schools that practice holistic admissions, okay? We've done many episodes on this. There's numerical admissions, admissions by the numbers, and holistic admissions. If it's a school that does admissions by the numbers, which is a substantial portion of schools, mostly non-selective, moderately selective, and selective, but occasionally even some very selective schools do that. But most of the schools that do holistic admissions tend to be on the on the very selective and the highly selective side. So this won't pertain to a school that's doing admissions by the numbers. That's the first caveat. Second, what I'm giving you is my perception. This is my perception. So this is Mark Stucker's view. That's important. Others may differ. Thirdly, and this is the most important thing, every school is different. So what I'm going to give you is my overall perception, whether the public properly understands the weight this plays in the process, underrates it, overrates it. But remember, I'm mostly speaking in terms of averages. So in, as far as you're concerned as an individual school, student interested in individual school, you need to find this information out for your specific school. Was and that enough? How many, and how many years have you been doing this, Mark? 
So uh, this think. is year 20. Yeah, okay. Two decades. Let's just take that into consideration, folks. All right. You ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. The first one. Great. So I'm going to say properly weighted because people understand that grades are really, really important. Sometimes it's overrated because, for example, a lot of times if I have a valedictorian and people say, I can't believe the valedictorian didn't get in and the student ranked number 13th got in and they don't get that. So sometimes overly rated, but because grades are so important in the process and people know it, I'll say properly weighted. Okay. All right. The next one is academic rigor. Underrated, for especially for highly selective schools, it is huge, uh, huge. Uh, you know, the most selective schools like to see that you have taken the most rigorous courses across all of your core areas. Hmm. Mm. You know, okay. math, science, English, history, foreign language, and that you have done well in those areas. Okay. And oh, so sorry. people don't understand that. All right. You know, a lot of times people think that, hey, it only my school only required me to take two foreign languages. Well, the school's highly selective school might want you taking three or four. All right. The third one is great trend. Now, can we? Underrated. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, wait, wait, go wait. ahead. Let, let's quickly define it real quick because I just, my brain just went left. Like great trend. What is that great trend about? Yeah. Yeah, so you may this is 30 episodes ago or so. We talked about how there are five grade trends. Okay, you can be consistently high, grades all high. Oh, that's you right. You can be consistently right. okay. low. Mm-hmm. You can be going up, you can be going down, or you can be doing what I call the roller coaster. Okay, all right. Right? Dive Those in. are the five grade trends. Extremely important. Colleges are going to read your applications backwards. So, how you are in 11th and 12th is a better reflection of who you are now. So, what is your grade trajectory? Upward. The two good trends, heading upward or staying high, every other trend is bad. Consistently low, going down, and the roller coaster. It's extremely important, and the public doesn't realize how important grade trend is. It's not only extremely important, it's really underrated, and the public doesn't understand this. Okay. Next is ACT or SAT. (sighs) This was tricky. Because I would say it can be underrated if you're out of the school's 25th to 75th percentile. So if you're out of their score profile, um, it can be tough to get in. It happens because 25% of kids do get taken outside of there, right? But you need to have something compelling that you're offering if you're out of the school's score profile. So in that sense, it could be underrated. But it also can be overrated because let's say it's just like I said with grades, Anika, let's say two kids apply and one kid has a 34 in the ACT and another kid has a 31, Mm -hmm. like people will be like, I can't believe it. This kid had a 31 and they got in and I had a 34. That's because they've overrated it. There are a number of highly selective colleges that are also test optional. And so in those instances, test scores are overrated because they're a complete non-factor. A lot of times people think that it's only non-selective schools that are test optional, but that is not correct. Mm, okay. So I'll say properly, I'll say properly rate it. Okay. Subject tests. For schools that require them, they're underrated. Okay. Okay. A lot of schools have done significant amount of research that subject tests predict grades better than ACT or SAT scores. And so there are a few small group of schools, and many of these admission counselors have told me this is our single best predictor of how kids do. Yeah, Mm -hmm. But overall, I will say overrate it because we're only talking about two dozen schools that require the tests anymore. And it's mostly engineering schools. So mostly overrated. Okay. Now remember, folks, this is under, over, or properly rated by the student and the parent. So don't forget that. Correct. Okay. Yes. Very important. Next, AP or IB scores. This one's also tricky because students take AP score. They take these tests at the end of the year. What that means is that if you're in 12th grade, which is a lot of times you're taking your most rigorous classes, schools don't have access to the scores because they have to make decisions before then. Right. So and some so a lot of times they're not seeing these scores unless you took a test in the in the 9th, 10th or 11th grade. Also, there are schools that feel like we can't judge a kid if they didn't take the test because maybe they didn't have the 100 bucks because that's what the test costs, Mm. approximately. But for the most selective school, everything counts. So you do not want to be in an extreme low side because, once again, they respect these tests. They respect the rigor that they mention. So I'll go with properly rated. Okay. 
Next is the high school you attend. Whew, these are tough. I'm going to say properly rated. Uh, there are extremes here as well. Schools can develop informal partnerships mm. with other colleges, high schools I'm talking about. Wow. And they really know your school and they have a track record. And some schools even track how well kids from your school have done. So it can be a big plus factor in those instances. But those are, are rare instances. Uh, there's still so many other factors in the, in the, in the evaluation besides this. Um, that I'll go, I'll go with properly rated. Okay. Because people know that if you're at a certain school, it counts for something. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think the general perception is about much because the other thing schools are thinking is too much is given, much is required. And so you have to balance out the advantages of a more rigorous school with the fact that you've been exposed to more, you've had more opportunities. So I'll go with properly rated, but that was a really hard one. Another thing to keep in mind about some of the schools that the colleges respect the most to some of the high schools is that oftentimes those schools, it can be very difficult to get straight A's. It can be very difficult to be at the top of the class. So sometimes while you get some credit for being at a more rigorous school, it's more college preparatory. It's also harder to impress with your transcript. So it balances out. Okay. Let's take a breather for a second. You can, we've okay. covered seven so far. Any, any, uh, any thoughts so far? No, I, th- I love it. I love, I love the rate. I love the way you're, where you're going. I think it's hitting it right. The nail on the head. Is that good enough? Well, let's keep it humming then. <laughs> Look, is that good enough to keep yeah. going? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> the next one is the major you, exp- Ooh, this is a good one. Cause I got like three people off the top that I can think of the major you express interest in school you apply to. Oh my God. All right. Yeah. So what I mean by that is there are some universities where you don't just apply to the college itself. You apply to colleges within the school, well, you know, or sometimes called schools within the university. You know, for, for example, if you're let's just say Georgetown, if you're applying to Georgetown. OK, there's arts and sciences, there's <coughs> college of business and there's just foreign service. Each school can have its own admission process and different selectivity rates. So what I will say for this is if you are applying to a liberal arts college, then it is it is overrated. OK, major doesn't make much of a difference. Right. It's all about interdisciplinary learning. Mm-hmm. But if you are applying to a school and you're applying to what we call an undersubscribed major, you know, one that they really don't get that many people that apply to and they really want more then it can be underrated. Mm. That was powerful for many. So it's tough. So that's, yeah. yeah so it's very precise advice there. Okay. Then, oh, this next one, te- teacher recommendations. I feel they're underrated. The schools really? do holistic admissions. Oh my for me, yeah, for me, teacher recommendations, just huge, you know, because they speak so much to how you are in the classroom. Okay. As Peter Johnson, rest in peace, used to say, Columbia for 35 years. Grades are nothing more than symbols of achievement. This is what he would say. I bet you can think of an A student you wouldn't want to be on an elevator with for 30 seconds, Ooh. let alone in a class all year, right? Mm-hmm. Well, we feel the same way. And that's how he would say. So how do you impact your peers? What is your love of learning like? What is your character like? You, you know, how inquisitive? Are you a stimulator of class discussion? All these things, your integrity. I feel teacher recs are huge, but... Um, a lot of times schools will take note if it's at a really huge school and you don't student, teachers don't know the students as well. It may cut you a little bit of slack, but overall, I feel they're ex- extremely underrated. Mm. Okay, halfway mark. We're at counselor recommendations. Underrated as, as well. A counselor gets to put you in the context of the entire school. And a lot of times schools can rely on that counselor to put you in the context of the of the school. And the Common App asks the counselor to fill out a lot of very specific information that's very important to schools. Some schools write full prose letters and really get a chance, once again, because they can put you in the context of all the students in the school, Mm. I feel in general that they're underrated at the highly selective schools that do holistic admissions. Yeah, and I think as a parent, I would have contributed to that (laughs) because I totally would have not taken that so seriously. Okay, so (laughs) on to the, okay, outside Mm -hmm. recommendations. Ooh, this is tough. That um, is. So uh, uh, an outside recommendation, let's, let's, first of all, let's define it. So this is a recommendation coming from outside the school, right? Now, an outside rec doesn't have to be outside of the school. Technically, an outside recommendation is one that is outside of your core 
academic teachers. So if you have a recommendation from within the school, from a coach or from an advisor to a club that you work with or an activity, someone who supervises or teaches or mentors you, and it's still someone within the school, that is still an outside recommendation because it's outside of your core teachers. Um, I personally really like outside recommendations a lot. So you did a research project and the person that mentored you that oversaw the your research, they write about you or your outside coach uh, writes a letter uh, about you. So, I, you know, I I find them to be underrated because I think they can give you a real good glimpse. Um, but but once again, when I say underrated, I'm talking about really impactful ones where they know the person well mm-hmm. and they speak a lot to who they are. If it's just like generic stuff, no, then then it's garbage. Mm. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt. <laughs> it is what it is. Okay, next. Personal statement. Whew, boy. So I'll say properly rated only because people understand that the essays are really main essay is important. This is important. Like this is most admission officers will tell you this is their favorite part of the file, right? This is where they really get to know you. This is where you develop that visceral connection between the admission officer and the student. Um, I lean toward being underrated, but I think of what former admission officer Pomona used to say, 80% of them don't move the needle. Uh, it's the other 20% that have a significant impact on our decision. And a public does understand they're very important. So I'm torn between properly rated and underrated. They are really important. Hmm. Next, school-specific essays. Oh, now this is definitely underrated, extremely underrated, and usually not well done. Most of the time when hmm. I see drafts, they're terrible. They're not good. Um And this is the only part that the college controls, the single only part of the entire file that they get to dictate what you write on are these school-specific essays. And so they're very carefully chosen to learn whether or not a student, you know, is an appropriate fit and match for that school. Oh, this is the Y. Davidson essay. (laughs) Yes, yes. No, exactly. You remember that one? Oh, my flashback. Ooh-wee. But the... But but all of them, you know, one of my favorite ones this year, I'm working with a student right now, w- Wake Forest this year, right? So this is, they're not just, when I say school-specific essays, we could broaden it and say school-specific questions. Mm-hmm. So Wake Forest has a question this year that says, name your top 10. And that's it. So the student's like, my top 10 what? I'm like, yeah, no, no. it's like whatever you want your top 10 to be. What? Do you want it to be? Do you want it to be like your top 10 books, your top 10 favorite things oh to do? The top Ooh, 10 feels like you've accomplished they do name that. your top oh. Yeah, so so I'm counting all of that in school specific, like short answers. Um I think it was Davidson this year that had that question. Name name all the books that you've read for oh. school and for pleasure. Okay. Yeah. So so no, these are these but but these school specifics very very important and very underrated my So opinion, so extremely. parents and students are not taking them as seriously, right? Is is what we're saying. Well, you know, partly they don't take them that seriously. They think the personal statement the reason why I said, the personal statement is extremely important. The reason I said properly read is people get that that matters a lot. Okay. But they tend to think oh, these little small 150 word, 250 word ones, they're an afterthought okay. and they rush through okay. them. Okay. But also, they don't know how to do good gotcha. ones. That's the other gotcha, thing. gotcha. Okay, next. Okay, yeah. we're on the last, I think, seven. So we're at yeah. extracurricular activities. So what I will say about extracurricular activities is that titles are overrated. So people say, oh, I want to say I was in the beta club, or I was in National Honor Society, or I was on the student council. But I will say impact is underrated. So if you are... Sh- proven that you are a high impact person that positively impacted the school in a major way where you're when you leave your presence will be greatly missed then that can that can be you know that's important because people schools want to know or they don't just want I always tell people highly selective schools it's not good enough to be smart and to be a good kid you got to be bringing more to the table so underrated right 
Um, underrated when you've had a lot of impact, overrated just because you have the right titles. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And I, I stand corrected. We were actually at the last nine, but we're on number eight now. We're on countdown. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so, so let's just take, <laughs> let me take a quick break because I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Any, 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 any comments and anything no, so far? No, I think I was totally on mark with what you were saying because if they were underrated, <laughs> I totally underrated it. And if they were like right there, I was yeah. right there. So I think you're you're good, Mark. Good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Look, thank I'm giving you. you your professional review. Yeah, I know. I noticed that. I noticed that. The and next, this- next podcast, you're going to say Anika Madden, college expert. <laughs> Not <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next is demonstrate. We're on number eight, I think. Pardon me, y'all, if I miss this up. But no, I think this we're is on number 15. eight. This is 15. No, 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 eight. No, no, eight. Last eight. The last eight. The last eight. The last eight. Oh, we're counting down. Okay, okay. we're on yes, countdown. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the countdown. Okay, I get it. We're yeah. on demonstrated interest. All right. Now, I'm, once again, this is so school specific related because you know. We got Rick uh, Clark from Georgia Tech on on this podcast, and he will tell you that's not something that they're tracking, um, <clears throat> but definitely underrated. Definitely underrated. Um, schools aren't trying to give you a trophy, okay? Meaning, you know, here's your admission letter. Good, lo- Congratulations, you got in. They're trying to enroll the best class with the lowest acceptance rate. And it's growing in importance as schools, students keep applying to more and more schools. So you got this vicious cycle, apply to more schools, so schools get harder to get in. So the percentage acceptance rate goes down. So schools think students think that they need to apply to more schools to cover their base and more and more and more apps. And schools are trying to figure out who is serious about us in here. Mm. Like, you know, and so so I would say DI is we often call it, demonstrated interest DI, definitely underrated. And on the rise. But can I'm sorry to digress on this one, but I remember going to, and I'm going to call them out. And you can cut this out in the edits if you want to. But we went to a Duke University info session. Jalen uh-huh. thought he wanted to go to uh-huh. Duke since he was like five. He had been talking about Duke University. Uh-huh. Long story short, he didn't go there. Uh-huh. Went for a visit. Blah, 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 blah. But anyway... They said clearly in that session, they was like, we don't care nothing about demonstrated interest. Like he made such a point about, we don't care if you come five times, if you do all this stuff. Now, is that because of the stature of the school? Like Duke is a big school, right? There's a, it's a name brand school. Is that because they got it like that where they can do that? And it's just not the, it's not the norm with other like lower name brand schools or what is that about? Well, you asked me a really tough question, but you know, we pride ourselves in the straight talk express mm-hmm. here. So, so sometimes when schools say that they're not actually saying what you think they're saying. So when some people think when demonstrated interest means like the more times you show up, the more times you talk to somebody that increases your chances of getting in. Okay. And I can tell you Duke values whether or not somebody's going to come, oh, you can look at the. Mark. You can look at. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off because that's the opposite of what he was saying. We can we can edit all of this out. I promise. No, they no they value whether or not that. What? Why do you think their acceptance rate for early decision is so much higher than their acceptance rate for regular? So, Mark, you can edit this a huge, out. But- a huge part of that. A huge. Now, let me. I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. I was meeting with someone high level at MIT, okay? And they say, we don't care about demonstrated interest. And I said to them, you tell people that your acceptance rate for people that have it, that interview is 10% and people that don't interview, it's under 1%. You also have your own entire application. They don't, they're not on the common app. So you've already built demonstrated interest into your evaluation metrics. And they kind of said, you know what? You got me, you know? <laughs> so, so a lot, no, here, this is what, this is what I need to say. Sometimes when schools say we don't measure demonstrated interest, this is what they mean. There are schools that have created these complicated, elaborate um, <clears throat> formulas, really. A lot of times they'll hire enrollment management people from the outside to figure out Okay, we're going to give you 50 points for a visit. We're going to give you 10 points every time you talk by somebody at a fair. Okay, if you visited your school and you came by, we're going to give you points. If you send an email, we're going to give you give you points. And they could go on and on and create. Things. So some schools have complex <coughs> models and other schools don't. 
So a lot of times when schools say we don't track DI, they mean we don't have a complicated model that we've come up with that we plug in to figure out if you're going to come. But that doesn't mean that if the school feels like you're not going to come, that that's not a factor at all in their decision process. Those are not the two, those two things are not the same. A lot of this confusion about demonstrated interest is how it's being defined. So let's go back to what you said earlier, Nika, about Duke. Um, Duke's defining it differently. And another thing that Duke is trying to do is they're trying to keep their admission officers from being stalked, from being hounded. They don't want people thinking, I need to come back three, four, and five times because that's going to show more interest. No, that shows that you're stalking them and they need to spend their time on other applicants. But I will make one point, and hopefully this will uh, convince you why I feel demonstrated interest is underrated. If you look at schools like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, some of the most selective, most prestigious schools in the country, for one year, if you look back at 2002, they went to what we call unrestricted early action, um, meaning that if you applied early to those schools, you could apply early to as many schools as possible. And after one year, they changed it, and they went to restricted early action. Why? Because their yield was decreased, and they wanted people to at least tip their hand and show what school you're most interested in, at least at, in November, even if you're not binding them to attend. That's what I mean by demonstrated interest. To me, demonstrated interest is any indication at all that you're not coming will work against you, and any indication at all that you are coming can help your application. You gave me a little flashback, Mark, and I'm not going to digress on it now, but you're right. Oh, my God. I'm going to tell you about it later. Okay, next is interviews. But, but I will say this. There are some schools that don't look at DI at all. I'm not trying to say every single school does, but most schools is underrated. Okay, interviews. So I'm going to say overrated for most schools because so few schools have them. And, and all, most of the time when they do, it's what we call an informational interview, not an evaluative interview. But I will say it's properly rated for schools that do evaluative interviews. There are schools that do evaluated interviews, though it's very important, and especially – and this is true a lot of times at the women's colleges, an admission officer actually is the one doing the interview. Now, think about it. If you're going to pay someone's salary, they're going to take that their time to interview you. It is important. Mm-hmm. So overrated, but there are some cases that are also underrated. Okay. Next is discipline incidents in your school records. Ooh. Okay. Now, this is the first time I'm going to cop out. I'm trying to shoot straight here. I have to answer this one by saying it depends. So discipline is evaluated three ways, right? How recent was the event? Was it isolated or repeated? How long ago was the event? And how severe was the event? So I just have to say all of those things are going to matter. And if if it's either severe or repeated or recent, that's a big deal. Then not significant, not repeated in the ninth grade. So I'm going to cop out and say oh, it depends. No. I'm allowed, I'm allowed my one mulligan cop out card. <laughs> <laughs> that was an extreme one. So you don't get any more. <laughs> okay. 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 Next, underrepresented diversity. Ooh. So I'm going to say properly rate it, right? So the more unique, the more valuable. So if a school has no Native Americans and you're the first, that's important. If you're the first kid in Wyoming, they've gotten in three years. And now they can say they have 40 states, not 39. Then that's important. Right. So so there's a correlation between how rare is the diversity that you're bringing and how valuable it is. Nobody's still giving you a one one hundredth of a point on your GPA. So you got to be able to do the work and you got to be a great addition to the community. But I'll say properly rated because I feel the public does feel like diversity counts. And I will say that it does. But the more distinct and unique, the more it will matter. Last four personal qualities. PQs, very, very underrated. Hmm. So this is what kind of a roommate are you going to be? Will our students like you? Will our faculty like you? Can you get along with different types of people? Are you intellectually curious? Do you have grit? Do you have a positive attitude? Do you have an adventuresome spirit, work ethic, integrity? I'll say very important and very underrated. Yeah, I agree with that one. All right, next, match and fits. Underrated. Very important. Now, wait, it's can not you just explain that you... a little bit? Like, what do we mean yeah, by match and fit? Yeah. yeah. So, so this is, okay. So let's say a school is looking at someone and they're the most extraordinary academic student they've ever seen. And they're, and, and, and as a leader and a community member, this person is unbelievable. 
But let's say the school feels like, you know what? I think this kid's student needs a bigger school. I don't think I see them being happy here. Mm. Or they need a school that we're too remote, we're too rural, or we're too urban, or they're too conservative. They would do better in more liberal school. Or they're too liberal. We're too conservative. That's what it means. Like, are they, are they who they are and what they're looking for, a match and a fit, not just for our institution, but for the major they're applying for as well. So match and fit is extremely important and underrated in the schools that do holistic commissions. Hmm. In my opinion. I'm going to come back to that, Mark, a little bit later. All right. Next is okay. artistic or athletic hook. Okay. So when we say hook, we're talking about what we call a tipping factor, right? It's something, a unique talent that you bring that is an institutional priority for the school that will strengthen the community of the school. So I'm going to say it is underrated if you are a game changer. Okay. So if you're an athlete in a revenue producing sport, Okay, that's major. And that's got to be defined, by the way, by the coach wanting you, the school wanting you, not that you think you're an athlete. We get a lot of that. (laughs) Okay, Uh, and so, yeah, if you're a game changer and you're going to really contribute in a unique way, I'm going to say it's underrated. If you're just if it's not a revenue producing sport and you're just a contributor, barely a contributor, it it matters, but the public knows that it matters. So I'll say then it's properly. Wait, rated. Mark, can I challenge that? Because I sure. feel like athletes is like the first go to outside of academics for parents to say, oh, my child is off the charts. So, mm-hmm. you know, whether they are off the charts or not, I feel like they I feel like parents feel like that's the go to for getting into that institution. So how is that underrated by the by the student and the parent when that I this is just Anika feeling like no 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 this is important. So do you remember when I said I'm defining it by the school really wanting you, not the parent or the kid thinking that they have an elite elite athlete. I'm saying that if you're that recruit that the school really wants, because you're going to you know enhance their symphony, uh, you know because you're so amazing at the French horn or the bassoon. Okay, or you're the running back they need on their team, then it's underrated. Okay. It's not in the eyes of whether the parent thinks their child is good. It has to do with if the school really, really wants you. Uh, But the reason why I say only if you're that sort of elite recruit, because the public perception is that athletics do count a lot, and they do. So I'll say properly rated. But if you're an elite recruit or unique recruit, then underrated. Okay. I feel like I still didn't. Did, did, did Do you still want to challenge me? I do, but I'm going to do it later. <laughs> okay. Well, 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 arm wrestle. <laughs> I did. I'm joking. The I'm last, joking. last. We're finally at the last one. Alumni mm-hmm. status. I heard some comments around from my own colleagues around this recently. I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. So for the highly selective school, I'm going to say that all of my status is overrated. Mm. Like it is a, it is a oh plus factor. Yes. That's what it's they- not an automatic. And one of the things, um, one of the times when, I, when students or parents are, you know, the, the most despondent and the most consternation is when an alumni doesn't get in and it's sort of sense of, Oh my goodness. I, I just thought for sure I was getting in. My kid was getting in mm-hmm. because I went to that school. Yep. Uh, uh, and so, but what happens at a lot of highly selective schools is the alumni base is large. So the number of kids that apply of alumni status is just Ooh, significant. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, now, now the larger the school, you know, it, you know, it, it, it may not be as competitive, but, it, you know, in general, I feel like there's an elev. you know, I feel like it's overrated. It, it, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter as much as the average person thinks it does. Mm, That's all yeah. I'm saying. And let, let me be the first first witness to say I, <laughs> I totally agree with that <laughs> personal experience. So what do you think? Was this fun, Anika? Did you like it? It was awesomely fun, but I do feel like there are some clarification we need to make among a few of them. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so is, is that is that an off recording conversation? <laughs> yes. or is that bring it back on another podcast? That's an off recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, remember, and I know, I know that your your concern is like all these parents putting all this time, money into athletics, and neglecting and neglecting academics, and not wanting to. I get that concern. 
So that's important that we don't, you know, there's so many, that's another conversation, right? Like mm-hmm. whether people feel like this is their ticket and therefore they need to invest all in that. Cause I see that mistake made all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I want to say, I can't say enough. This is, this is Mark Stucker's opinion and people can disagree. And I, I can't say enough. <laughs> Check your individual school because this is school by school. Excellent. You get an A plus, Mark. You know what, listeners? If you like this, let us know. And if you didn't like it, shoot us that. Let us know that as well. I'm just curious. I thought we try something a little different for our 50th. And what's our email, Anika? Questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Bingo. Friends, if you missed our last episode, then you're going to want to go back and hear my interview with Rick Clark. It was one of my favorite interviews I've done so far. In last week, he talked about what is the proper way to respond if you get a deferral or a denial. And this week, he'll talk about what is the proper way to respond if you are waitlisted or you are accepted. Listen and enjoy. And now this week's interview with a special guest. So, so, so let's transition. Let's talk about wait lists. And why don't you start, uh, start us off by, by differentiating wait lists and deferrals, because that can be confusing because obviously there's some similar similarities, but there's a reason why we have it in, in its own bucket. Yeah. Some differences as well. Yeah. So again, deferral is going to be, you know, students who had applied in an earlier round, be that EDEA or any derivation thereof, right? There's a bunch of, uh-huh. bunch of them now. Uh, and so again, that's the, that's the wait, that's the hold on, that's the tell us more. It is an opportunity for kids to send fall grades. It is an opportunity sometimes depending on the school to send another essay or update them on what they've been doing outside the classroom, maybe even have an interview. Um, wait list is, is in a lot of ways very similar. Um, but the idea mm-hmm. is that that would be coming in the next round in, in March or April when schools release out of their, or out of their regular round. Um, Obviously, like the the seventh layer of admission purgatory is when you get deferred and then waitlisted. <laughs> but we're not gonna we're not gonna go there now. Yeah, um, no, no, <laughs> you know, and and no one likes that, man. I mean, that just that kind of sucks all around. I mean, I, we don't like doing it. We I wish I was smarter and could figure out a way to never have that happen. Nobody likes having that happen. But um, but anyway, the you know the idea of waitlist is is again, I mean. Frankly, it is schools making sure that they're going to get the class that they need. And so they look at their whole pool at that point and they say, here's our admits. These are the kids 100 percent that we want to be here. Here's our denies. These are the kids 100 percent that we know that either aren't competitive and there's certainly some of those uh, or they just aren't going to be as competitive, you know, and we know that we're not going to ever offer them admission, right? In this, in this year, mm-hmm. in this year, in this applicant mm-hmm. pool, doesn't mean they're not smart or capable or going to have a great other options, but it's not happening. And we know that the waitlist group then is that sort of middle group where they say it could work out. And it is just, it is basically like schools protecting themselves and cushioning themselves. Mm-hmm. And they've got, mm-hmm. you know, we're all operating off of these formulas. We're basically operating mm-hmm. off of these yield models that have been, based on historical data and to the best of mm-hmm. our ability a george this is a georgia tech example a georgia tech, a georgia kid a georgia resident generally yields at 68% whereas mm-hmm. a student from out of state generally yields at 25 26% now that depends on state depends on major there's some factors mm-hmm. but broadly speaking mm-hmm. that's the case well Hey, Rick, let me interrupt you for one sec. We, we've defined this a lot, but I always want to keep in mind our first time listener. Uh, yield is just simply a mathematical formula. If a school accepts 100 students and, and the yield is 68 percent, that means 68 of those 100 will choose to matriculate and enroll just in case someone uh, doesn't know that. So, yeah, if you could pick that. Yeah, up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, right. I mean, the, the number of kids that, that say yes to your offer or the percentage of kids right. that say yes to your offer. Uh, and so yeah. and so basically. You know, what you do is that if you're trying to hit certain targets, as we described uh, for tech on the geography side, but let's say a school, you know, just added a new uh, academic program or they've decided that they can't get too many of this uh, major, you know, in the in the next year. Right. They're just booming in that area and they need to curb that back. 
they're basing their offers off of history and things change, mm-hmm. right? I mean, um, in the first year of the new presidential administration, most schools around the country um, took a hit from international students. Their yield rate for international students went down. And so, you know, mm-hmm. things change and, 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 and you build mm-hmm. models off of what you know, but you also give yourself the mm-hmm. weightless cushion for if things shift and you need to fill certain buckets or certain holes. And so that's one of the things families should know with the waitlist too is it's not ranked, right? We don't say there's mm-hmm. a thousand kids on our waitlist and you are number mm-hmm. 438. It's not like a line to get into a restaurant or, you know, something like mm-hmm. that. It is, it is a way that schools build and shape their class based on where they might miss their targets um, once May 1st hits, you know, and that, that deposit deadline hits. Um, you know, the, the, the other thing about waitlist, I mean, the biggest thing about waitlist, two things. One, in most cases, you're not actually on the waitlist. You've been offered the waitlist and you need to do something like claim your spot, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, so sometimes right, right. families miss that step, even though we say it in a lot of ways, yep. but you got to claim your spot on the waitlist. Um, but the mm-hmm. other thing is, because financial packages and other schools offers and frankly, just human natural procrastination um, means that a lot of kids don't deposit until late April. And so because mm-hmm. May 1's that national deposit deadline, the other thing you've got to do if you get waitlisted is put your money down somewhere else. Um, you know, mm-hmm. you have to cover your bases. And I do think that this is yep. back to your question earlier about like emotions. I mean, this is a hard spot because you have to start to get excited about somewhere else. uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yet, no, like it could work out. And man, this is why no one loves the wait list. Um, In fact, uh, a couple (laughs) of years ago, I wrote a three part series on my blog called the wait list sucks because there's just no other way to put it. Um, (laughs) That is just the most (laughs) accurate way to put it. Yeah, and I think when do, do you guys share your your numbers when they're released, either either in a newspaper yeah. article or, or on your website? We give yeah. that. We give historical numbers. Yeah, we try to be helpful there. Because I do think that's helpful for people because sometimes people stereotype and they say, you know, um, if it's a highly selective school and you're waitlist or deferred, then your chances are are slim to none. But actually, that can vary so much from school to school. Uh, you know, depending on depending on their process and their year. Right, I've seen some really, really highly selective schools that take a sizable chunk off their wait list. And then there's others that that take slim to none. And then I, I think that can help people to at least emotionally prepare. Hopefully, mm-hmm. you're, hopefully, you know, people are reasonable enough to see that, OK, if three percent of kids are getting it off the wait list, then, I, you know, I can't really throw my eggs in that basket. Yeah, without a doubt. That's right. Rick, can you comment on the practice of waitlisting kids? You would have admitted but because you don't think the student is going to come or you're not sure if they're going to come, they get waitlisted. And the school sort of lets the student prove to the college or university that they really want to come to the school. Um, as you know, some schools use waitlist to increase their yield. And I want to know just what you think about this. So in terms of schools that are uh, waitlisting students who they don't think is going to come, I do think that's actually happening. Um I will say that's not something that we will do here at Georgia Tech. We we take who we want to take and we wait list who we would like to take if we could. Um, but I do think that you're right that certainly there are some schools that are waitlisting students to have them demonstrate interest or prove it. Um, and they do that by putting them on the waitlist, see if they accept a spot in the waitlist. And then often we'll go even earlier than late April in order to bolster yield. So basically, they are uh, doing this as an opportunity to to get a higher yield um, for their class. And the the one thing I can say about that is um, you can get a sense, at least in my opinion, of some of the schools that are doing this by looking over the history of what they've done in the past. If you're seeing some schools that are going in mid-April or sometimes even early April to their wait list, you know that they're doing that. And so that is one way for students to know um, if a school either kind of has this practice or um, now, of course, that's not going to show whether or not you're going to be one of those students to get pulled. But again, I guess my take on the entire admission process is if you get deferred and they ask you to do something and you're still interested, do it. If you get waitlisted and they ask you to do something, do it. And so 
Um, it's not something you're going to know per se uh, on what's going to happen in your particular case. But I do think that you will find some schools who sort of have this overall practice, they have this overall um, trend, and it's something that you can identify. Obviously, that's something to talk to a school counselor about, uh, or if you're working with an independent counselor, talk to them about it. Um, but even if you're not, it's something that a lot of students would be able to kind of go and research and figure out for themselves. Rick, some schools use courtesy wait lists. I know we did this when I did boarding school admissions for alumni kids, for twins, when we couldn't take one kid, for faculty kids, et cetera. Uh, can you explain what a courtesy wait list is and share your thoughts on whether a student can know if they're waitlisted, whether or not it's a legitimate wait list or if it's of the courtesy variety? Because, of course, for courtesy wait lists, you're not going to get admitted. Okay. What I would say about courtesy wait lists um, is that, yes, I think that, again, is something that schools do in certain cases, um, and obviously some to a greater extent than others. Uh, you could call this a soft no. Uh, you see this, I think, a lot of times when schools have just sort of ridiculously disproportionate wait lists. So, for instance, you know, their entire class is going to be a thousand and they have 4,000 on the wait list. Um, or they're making, you know, 5,000 offers to get 2,500 on the wait list. Their entire class size is only a thousand. I think in those kind of cases, you're not going to necessarily know if you are a courtesy wait list, but it should, even if they're not giving you percentages of students or numbers of students they've taken off the wait list in the past, It'll give you a pretty realistic idea of whether or not it's going to be something that um, you should put a whole lot of hope in or stock in. And, you know, frankly, again, this is one of those places where I feel like um, the college side is culpable for some of the anxiety and some of the misdirection and some of the uh, maybe appropriate questioning of the process that we get. Because, you know, if, if you've got four times the number of people on your wait list as you have in your class, you're either not very good at math. Uh, or you're doing some things that are just unnecessary within your overall process. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. As promised from last week, today in episode 50, we will reveal what I regard as the number one, the best, most comprehensive book when it comes to an overview of the college admissions process. And it is the book Admissions Matters, the fourth edition by Sally Springer and John Reeder. The subtitle of this book is What Students and Parents Need to Know About Getting Into College. Now, there are some great niche books out there. There's a slew of books on writing essays, on getting scholarships, on improving your test scores. But this is a comprehensive book. If I were to take the 100 most important subjects and topics when it comes to college admissions, this book, Admissions Matters, as well as last week's book, College Admission, is going to address all 100 topics. And so if you like this podcast or if you have my book, 171 Answers, and you like that, it's in the vein of these two things in terms of its comprehensiveness. So I can't recommend Admissions Matters enough, the fourth edition. It's current. It's updated. It's fantastic. I will now resume my interview with Rick Clark. So do we want to transition to accepts? Yeah, let's do it. Let's have finally some good news, right? I mean, the, <laughs> the 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 like, yeah, people may be, if they're still listening to us, they may be so beaten <laughs> up. They haven't, they've checked us out by now. So let's get oh, to some man. good news. Let's get to some good <laughs> news here. So um, one of the things I, I, I loved, and you just said it so, so, so succinctly when we, when we met over lunch, you said, you know, you can get accepted and be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and so why don't we start with that? What, what are some things to avoid, uh, you know, when you're when you're admitted? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's right. Um, you know, and we unfortunately see you see this online. You hear about it, you know, sort of sometimes unfortunately see it in person. But, you know, kids will get in and it's awesome to be excited and they should be and they should be celebrating that. But also cognizant of, you know, the fact that especially for some of the schools that do have these more selective rates, like there's a lot of kids around you who did not get good news. And, you know, <laughs> what we just talked about earlier, like maybe they're in that day or two period where 
they're trying, they're, they need to process it and they need, they're going to be fine. Um, but Uh they're going through that hard, hard spot. And so, you know, one of the things we try to actually communicate to the kids we admit is like, continue to be a good community member. I mean, the reason that we admitted you is not because you have a high test score, not because you took a bunch of AP classes or made good grades. Um, it's because like, you know, we see something in you from what you've done and who you are and what you wrote about. That means like you care about other people. You want to make this world around you a better place. And this is a good opportunity to do it. I mean, you know, if if empathy and caring and, and concern for others um, ever has a place, I think as a high school senior, maybe it's right around this time of year. And then again, in that mm-hmm. March, April time of year um, to just encourage people and you know, sometimes you've got to, you know, sort of just be mindful and cognizant of uh, of the others. And there will be plenty of time to celebrate and an appropriate place to do that. Um, but I do think that students should really keep that in mind. Um, that would be that would be you know, one thing. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, to just be also aware of how you do that online, you know, in, in social media. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, part of me feels like there's, there's so much to be said for, and, and over the years we have really encouraged students to share that they got in. Um, I, I mean, honestly, sometimes I just sort of ebb and flow a little bit on that though, because while I think it's cool and, and the reason we do it is because we want to sort of build excitement around our new class. And I think that's where the intent comes from with colleges when I really think about the way that might play out in other people's actual social network, (laughs) um, I am of two minds. And I I think there's, I think that's up to the student individually to sort of find the appropriate way to understandably celebrate. And then also, um, you know, just again, be cognizant and mindful of how that's going to impact people they care about that they are connected to online as well. Yeah, I'm 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 in the camp of not doing the online celebration because it's right now it's just incredible how connected kids are. Yeah. Somebody put something up online and everybody knows it like in thirty minutes or less. It is like it it's almost seems the equivalent of telling them. And uh-huh. and um, you know, I know people are well intentioned, but boy, it, you know it you know it can be re- somebody else is really going through uh-huh. what for many many kids is their first experience of what they regard as failure. Yeah. And so and so it's 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 just tough, you know, working in a boarding school environment. It was so tough, you know, because some as much as you'd put the word out to people, no running down the halls, no celebrating. Inevitably, it word got out and everybody kind of knew what happened to everybody else. And boy, it, it was really painful for for people that, you know, your best friend or good friend or even an acquaintance just got rejected while you got admitted. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I think people need to really be humble on the celebration side. And right. I, I, I think that extends to online online right now. Mm-hmm. That's just, just my opinion. No, no. I mean, it, it, it's true. And I mean, we won't go into it too much, but it, these are conversations that we've absolutely been having for, you know, do we do we break a little away from maybe what we've done in the past? Again, good intentions create excitement around a class and a new community, but maybe there's a different platform to do that on, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And you know, another thing you brought up, which is really important when you talked about be a good community member, be a good citizen. um, You want to comment, Rick, on sort of some conditional language that can be in admission offers about you continuing your (laughs) academic performance and not completely tanking any, anything you want to share on that? Yeah, I'm actually on a listserv with people around the country who are at public uh, universities. So admission directors at public universities, we have our own uh, listserv on that. And, And inevitably around this time of year, you know, you'll see that like, Hey, you know, can you share your letter with me? Cause I want to sort of look at our language around, um, making sure you keep your grades up, uh, uh, you know, which is obviously one of the one of the big ones. Um, and then also kind of behavior, discipline, you know, that kind of thing. So those are in general, those are the two biggest, um, you know, all schools are going to ask for final spring grades. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, in at least anecdotally, uh, in talking to, to colleagues from around the country, the number of rescinding uh, offers, you know, so pulling back offers because of major kind of egregious grade drops and just really punting uh, that that you know spring semester has <laughs> gone up a little bit. Um, the other thing is 
you know, we always encourage students that are admitted early, if you're going to make a major change to your schedule, so not even worried about like performance, but thinking about schedule. So, you know, the schools admit you, um, and this would be especially true for some schools. And there are some, you know, really good schools who make decisions really early. I mean, you're getting schools sometimes putting decisions out in October, November. They didn't even see your final fall grades. Um, and so if you're making mm -hmm. a, if you're making a course change, um, that's also really important to communicate to the school that's admitted you, uh, to say, listen, I was, mm -hmm. I was taking BC calculus. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. ideally you do it in advance and you say, yeah. But, yes. <laughs> you know, but I am thinking about switching to X. Like, is that going to have any bearing? Um, sometimes you get it, you know, I have switched my major to, but that's the type of conditional language that you will see in, in admit letters. And it's important to read. Like, they're going to expect that you maintain the uh, generally the schedule and performance as well as the sort of conduct that you exhibited and on which they made that initial decision. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fantastic. That's that's really really good. And um, just congratulations to all the students out there. You know, admit it early. And for those of you who who were not, um, lots of lots of time ahead of you here. And we wish all the students uh, nothing but the best as as we wind up this year. But before we wind down, Rick, uh, you've heard the podcast a few times. You you probably know I like to put people on the hot seat and ask a few personal questions just to. To let our let our listeners get to know you a little bit more, so okay. uh, why don't we why don't we start out with what you know? What's your favorite food? Oh man, I uh, just chips and salsa. I like to keep it simple, or just chips and guacamole. But man, I you know buy buy stock in Tostitos because I spend a lot of money on them. <laughs> there you go. What about uh, best book you've read in the last few years? Oh, let's see. That's a good one. Um. I reread, I've been rereading Pat Conroy uh, recently, hmm. and I read both My Losing Season, uh, which is about his um, uh, years playing basketball at the Citadel, uh, and then also mm -hmm. reread The Lords of Discipline about being at the, hmm. uh, being at the Citadel and sort of those college years with, with friends. So uh, just on a little bit of a Pat Conroy kick here lately. Good, good. You know, I get great books from the from this section, and I also get great great ideas from this question. What favorite place to vacation? <laughs> favorite place to vacation. So my parents have a house in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and uh, nice. man, it's just a simple little town down there. Um, but good food and low key and relaxing and just amazing weather. So uh, probably not so much in July and August, but pretty much any other time of year, it's a great place to go. Awesome. And let's close it out with uh, best advice for, for students out there. Oh man. I think the biggest thing is just to be reminded, like, you know, Frank Bruni wrote a book said, you know, uh, where you go is not who you'll be. And I think that we <laughs> in general just put so much emphasis on the name of schools. And I think that students need to be more focused on the uh, opportunities that they're given and just taking full advantage of those. And I don't think it's that hard to to believe that's true because that's really what's happened for a lot of students in high school. I mean, most students did not have a choice as to where they ended up in high school and they flourished there and they took advantage of things and they plugged in and made friends and have succeeded in that, in that spot. And not that we're just going to place you in any random college, but if that were to be true, it's really about the network you build and the advantage that you take of the opportunities you're given. You know, I, even that I have my own book, I, I tell everybody that that book, Frank Bruni's book, in my opinion, is the best admissions book I've, I've read. To that. The most important book, I think, is just essential. And I can't emphasize enough how, how impactful I think that is. So uh, Where You'll Go is Not Who You'll Be by Frank Bruni is like 10 or 11 bucks on Amazon. So mm -hmm. makes a great Christmas gift. I tell every one of my families to read it. So great. glad you put a plug in for there. And and before we close out, uh, Rick, why don't you tell people about your blog, which which I really enjoy. I know I started out with Rick's blog. I, I can't remember how I found it. But it was before we met. It might have been I'd heard you speak a few times. I didn't remember. But but I started I started uh, 
uh, paying attention to your blog. I really liked it. And then I found you had an audio version, which I like even more. So why don't you yeah. tell our listeners about your blog and let them know how, how they could uh, sure. uh, you know, receive it receive it as well. Yeah, well, so the blog is on our admission site, um, which is just admission.gatech.edu. And you can see it there in the horizontal navigation. And I think the biggest thing to know about it is it's really not about Georgia Tech. It's a lot about the stuff we've been talking about. I try to keep it very general. I try to keep it personal as well. Um, you know, the, in a lot of ways, people forget that these are humans reading applications. It's a personal human process, and, and we read applications that way. And so I try to bring my family into it, my personal experiences, um, just to sort of drive that point home. So um, yeah, I would I'd love for people to check it out, and uh, that's the best way to, to get a hold of it. Hey, Rick, thanks so much for coming on today to your College Bound Kid podcast. Really appreciate it, and, and it means a lot to, to myself, my podcast partner, Anika, and all of our listeners. Thank you, Mark. I've enjoyed it. Next week in the news, an uproar over blended and active learning. And we'll be in Chapter 51 of 171 Answers, and we'll be discussing how to select a test prep or tutoring company. And next week's question comes from a mom who wants to know if funds are available for transfer students. And Mark continues his conversation with Rick Clark, who's the director of undergraduate admissions for Georgia Tech. But this time they're talking about what you probably don't know about Georgia Tech. They are changing the game. And listeners, you know, episode 50, we gonna give you 50 extra minutes. So I know we went a little long this time, but uh, hopefully you liked it. <laughs> And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenball. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions, so send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.